Today on Applied Science, I'm going to show you how to take a laser diode and without any other optical components, make submicron measurements from a few centimeters away. But first, Nerd Thunder is a collection of YouTubers that are doing a little cross promotion in December, including Jerry Ellsworth, who actually inspired me to start making YouTube videos in 2011. So be sure and go check out those channels in the description. Okay, we're going to start out with a simple setup. We've got a laser diode here emitting uh, light. This is the pattern here without a lens on it. And we're uh, drawing about close to 24 milliamps. And I'm measuring the current out of the monitor photodiode here, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so if I just take a white card and pass it under the laser beam, check out the graph here showing the current history over time. <laughs> Did you expect that? That's actually kind of a surprise, right? I mean, what's going on here? There's no sensor other than the laser diode itself. And if we add a lens here, the effect works at a longer range even because uh, the lens is collecting more light coming back from this spot. And if I use a card with a retroreflector on it, now the signal is pretty massive. It's about 10x bigger because the retroreflector is sending all that light back in. So what's going on here? I mentioned that the laser diode has a monitor photodiode in it. So let's cut one of these laser diode packages open and you can see what I'm talking about. These laser diode packages are typically three lead devices. And so if you're thinking there's something more going on than just a light emitter, you'd be right. So I cut some of these open by mounting them in a lathe in a collet and then using a Dremel to very carefully grind away the outer shell until it fell off. And here you can see a whole bunch of diodes that I've cut up from different sources. Now you'll notice that in some of these cases there's actually two separate components within the package. There's actually the laser diode itself and then there's also a monitor photodiode sort of on the backstop of the package. And what happens here is when the laser diode is on, light is emitted forwards and backwards from the laser diode junction. And the backwards emitted light hits this monitor photodiode that's inside the package. And so the point of this is that if you want to really carefully control how much light is coming out of the laser junction, due to things like manufacturing tolerances and temperature changes, you really want to know how much light it's emitting, not just how much current it's consuming. So the manufacturers put these monitor photodiodes in so that your circuit can actually do closed loop control of how much light is really coming out. For better or worse, modern photodiodes typically don't have this monitor photodiode in there any longer. Uh, if you buy like these cheap um, laser pointers off of eBay, which are actually a really great deal for like 12 bucks, you can get all three of these. If you cut open the laser packages from inside these laser pens, um, typically the photodiode is not there. Even though the packages still have three leads, probably because they're using the old tooling, uh, it's just that they, um, they either ignore the third lead or it's just connected together with the other one. In these cases, the laser diode can handle pretty high currents, and so as long as you drive it in a constant current configuration and you aren't too concerned with the exact amount of light output, you can ignore the manufacturing tolerances and the temperature variations. In at least one case, I also found, uh, instead of a monitor photodiode, actually an entire integrated circuit with photodiode in the back of the package. And so this one is actually doing the light regulating inside the package, which is not going to work for this experiment that I'm going to show you today. And here's a really grody one. This one is totally cost optimized. They've gotten rid of the metal package altogether and just have the laser die like right on a piece of um, PCV material. So in the old days, like the 1990s, when these laser diodes were new, um, it was common to have a setup like this. So this is how the three leads are wired up. And in fact, I found this batch of old laser diodes uh, at Jameco that were on closeout and I actually bought the last of them. It's actually very difficult to find laser diodes that have a monitor photodiode and are cheap, you know, kind of like they were in the old days like this. So anyway, so in this first setup, this is how we have it configured. So 24 milliamps coming in, this is the emitter side of it, and this is the photodiode side of it. And the photodiode is reverse biased, and so there's about two volts uh, at the, at the uh, third lead of the package. And then we're going to put our current meter here so that the reverse leakage current through this photodiode is what we're measuring. And it's about 50 microamps or 60 microamps when the thing is running. So this is already pretty neat. I mean, we've got basically a on-off sensor, but it also functions as a distance sensor. And so if I slowly move the card in and out like this, we're actually getting an analog interpretation of how far away the card is. 
And um, with a little bit of tweaking, you could actually make this into quite a usable circuit. So what's happening is the light is coming out of the laser diode, reflecting off the card, the lens is focusing it back into the package, and we're picking up the signal on this monitor photo diode. Now what's cool here is that the laser diode light is coherent, meaning it's all in one phase, like one wave coming out of the package. So when we put a reflector down here, it's actually coherent light being reflected back into the package, and we have the possibility of getting the light to interfere with itself. So in the next setup, uh, I'm going to show you how to measure this interference pattern, which will let us measure really small movements far away from the laser diode. In this setup, we're going to use the oscilloscope to look at that microamp current signal coming from the monitor photodiode. So here you can see the power supply that we're using for the laser diode, and this is about the 24 milliamps going in. I'm actually using this in constant voltage mode because I've very carefully characterized this specific diode. And I have a current limit, but currently it is in current uh, constant voltage mode. Uh, we're not using the multimeter anymore. I actually have a circuit over there that's converting that microamp current signal into a voltage, which we're displaying on the oscilloscope. So let me show you uh, what that circuit is. Okay, here's the circuit, pretty basic. This is known as a trans-impedance amplifier because it's going to convert the current signal from the photodiode into a voltage signal that we can look at on the oscilloscope. And so the way this works is if there's current flowing in or out of the op-amp leg here, the op-amp will servo the output to try to balance this out since we have the positive or the non-inverting input grounded. So if there's current flowing out, then the op-amp will servo current in to keep this node at the same zero voltage, right? and the feedback resistor is 100K. So this means that if we have one microamp flowing in or out here, there should be a 100 millivolts here going through this resistor to compensate for that. And the bandwidth here is going to be a few hundred K, maybe even a couple of megahertz, but it's not super critical. And there's a little feedback capacitance here to clean the signal up. Ideally, we want to reduce capacitance in these cases because we want high bandwidth. Uh, but for what we're doing today, just to make it clearer to see on the oscilloscope, I threw in a little capacitance there. And um, when doing circuits like this, it's very convenient to use two 9-volt batteries like this back-to-back uh, -to -back so that we get a uh, very clean voltage that's also floating relative to everything else. And I've built it up on this board here with a couple of sockets for the uh, resistor and capacitor so that I can quickly swap in and out values. This whole thing is DC coupled, but then I have the scope set to AC coupling so that when we look at the signal, we're really looking at only the AC component of current coming out of here. And um, the plus 9 volts gives us a lot of headroom, so that 50 or 60 microamp of DC that we don't really care about is going to be ignored. And then if there's a little bit of ripple current on here, which is the signal we're interested in, that will end up making its way all the way through to the oscilloscope. Here's the signal on the oscilloscope, and the full scale from top to bottom here is about 200 millivolts, so it's kind of like plus minus one microamp of current. And uh, the drive current for the laser diode is holding steady at about 23 and a half milliamps. It's warmed up and pretty stable. And then here we've got the card with the retroreflector tag on it. And if I move this around a little bit, you can see the signal kind of goes nuts, and it's still moving when I'm not touching the card. However, as you can imagine, this is pretty sensitive. If I basically just tap the card a little bit, we can see there's a ton of signal in there, but it's a little bit hard to pick out exactly what's going on. So to make this easier to see, what I'm going to do is put a tiny little speaker into the beam path, and the speaker has a retroreflective sticker on it. We'll zoom in so you can see this easier in a second. And then we're going to drive the speaker with this uh, function generator here. So currently we've got 60 hertz at 300 millivolts peak peak. So I'll turn the speaker on, and the yellow trace on the oscilloscope is going to show us the drive signal going into the speaker, and then the current signal from the monitor photodiodes being displayed up here. So let's uh, zoom in on the signal a little bit, and you can see there's something interesting happening here. If the speaker is responding perfectly to the sine wave, which I think it is at 60 hertz, this is why we're going very slow, uh, you can see that when the speaker is in motion, we're getting a signal from the monitor photodiode, and then when the speaker comes to a stop, because it's gotten all the way to the top or the bottom, the signal changes, and then it's back to high speed when it's moving again. So let's uh, zoom in on the speaker so you can see a closer look at it and try to figure out what's going on here.
Here's the setup, and we've got the same laser diode with the lens below it, and the lens is focusing the spot onto that retroreflective sticker that's on the speaker. And this speaker, you can't hear anything because it's only 60 hertz, and the frequency response of this speaker at 60 hertz is not very high. And also, it's, we're just driving it at very low amplitude, just 300 millivolts peak-peak. And we saw that that interesting-looking signal on the oscilloscope indicates that the diode is able to detect the frequency of the speaker moving even from this far away, and we can't hear anything, so it's a very sensitive detector. So here's what's going on here. The laser is emitting coherent light, right? And it comes out of the laser and strikes something and comes back, uh, maintaining some amount of that um, coherence. So that if we have a distant object, the exact position of that object relative to the waves of light coming out is important. If it happens to be that the, the object crosses the laser beam at a high point in the waveform, then the wave comes back and has constructive interference here, and we end up with like an extra light signal hitting that monitor photodiode in the back of the package. But if we move the object one half wavelength toward or away from us, now the thing is impacting at a lower part of the waveform, and when it reflects back, we get destructive interference back here, and the light experienced by that monitor photodiode will be less. So that if we have a thing moving back and forth here, it's constantly crossing the waves of light, and every time it moves a half wavelength, we get a half cycle of output on that monitor photodiode. This is basically an interferometer. It's just built with no extra components. Basically, the diode is doing the mixing for us, which is why it's called a self-mixing interferometer. So if we look at the waveform on the oscilloscope, we can actually say quite a lot about what the speaker is doing. I'll stop this just so we can get a close look at it. As the speaker moves up and down in this sinusoidal fashion, we can actually count the number of waveforms, the number of constructive and destructive interference events that that photodiode is witnessing. And since we know the wavelength of the laser light is about 650 nanometers, every time we see one of these peaks, that means another wavelength has, has gone by, right? So if we count this up, and let's just say it's about 10, then we know that it's 10 times 650 nanometers, or about uh, 6.5 microns of movement that the speaker is undergoing at this drive strength. So to test our assertion, <clears throat> let's try changing the amplitude of the speaker. So I'm going to change the amplitude here, and I'm going to go down. So you can see that the yellow trace now has less amplitude. And sure enough, now we're only getting about four peaks of constructive and destructive interference between these spots where it turns around. So now I'll head back up in amplitude. Now we're at 500 millivolts peak peak, and I'll keep going. Now we have a whole ton of them in here, and so if we stopped and actually counted this carefully, we could say at this drive strength, which is 800 millivolts peak peak, there's way more uh, peaks to count, and hence the speaker is moving further, and that makes sense because we're driving it at a higher strength. Let's try a few other things. I'll go back down in amplitude, and now I'm going to give it a ramp waveform. Let's take a look at this ramp waveform. So I've got the symmetry not quite 50%, so it's kind of slower here and then faster here. So the speaker is going to have to move more quickly here to cover that same amount of distance. And you can see if you squint at it, yeah, it looks like there's sort of less waveform going on here and a little bit of a denser waveform here. Let me make the uh, symmetry even more lopsided. So you can see now definitely the wave peaks are further apart in here and they're closer together in here, but something interesting happens if we keep going. So if I make this waveform really lopsided, <clears throat> it actually starts oscillating. It, the speaker itself is now being rung like a bell, right? So this, this slope here is sharp enough where it causes the speaker to start wiggling on its own accord, and we're actually seeing that in the interferogram here, or whatever, the information from this interferometer. We can even see it in here too, right? So as the thing is ringing, we can actually read that ringing signal with this laser interfer interferometer. If I bring the signal back down closer to symmetry, we can see even before there's ringing in the electrical signal, we can actually detect it with the interferometer. Back to the sine wave, everything is nice and controlled. And if I change the frequency here, uh, the distance that it covers, so the number of, of peaks that we'll get is actually the same, because the amplitude is the same. It's just they get further apart, right? So the actual number of 
of interference peaks between the top and bottom of the drive signal should be the same. They'll just be spread out more in time. So if we go higher and higher, it's still the same peaks now that they're getting compressed together. So the amplitude of this signal actually doesn't tell us much of anything. It's really the number of peaks. And uh, there's actually something else that's interesting here that we can check out. So if I change the speed back down again, and I'll stop the scope, Notice that the peaks are actually not symmetric. So when the speaker is moving toward the laser diode, the shape of this waveform is different than when it's moving away from the laser diode. This is not an accident, actually. There's something very interesting going on with the physics here that allow us to infer the directionality of the movement in addition to the, the movement itself. Pretty cool. I'll link to the paper that covers all this because the physics is, is slightly over my head. Um, I should point out, though, that this is a very, um, very sensitive system. So the exact drive current going into the diode matters. The exact temperature matters. The, uh, the type of movements that it can measure are also limited. It has to be right in the frequency band. And we are using a retroreflector to sort of increase the amount of signal going back in. But nonetheless, there's quite a lot of cool stuff going on. Also, some of you might be wondering why the pattern looks all stair-steppy like this. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later at the end of the video, but partially it's because the laser itself is responding to the interferometer. So instead of using a monitor photodiode, I've heard that it's possible to actually use the laser diode itself as the sensor. So if you very, very carefully monitor the current going into the laser diode and you're shooting laser light back in there, it will actually affect the laser diode itself. So you, in fact, don't even necessarily need the monitor photodiode, you can actually use the laser diode itself. I've tried this myself and didn't have a huge amount of success with it, but uh, in the academic literature apparently it is pop, uh, possible if you have a high enough gain amplifier. Let's look at a couple other waveforms quickly. With a square wave, I can actually hear the speaker now. So up until now all the waveforms that we've been looking at to my ears have not been audible, and I'll lean in so you can maybe hear this. And the reason that we can hear it is because the sharp snapping uh, voltage is actually oscillating the speaker membrane itself. And we can actually see that with the trace, just like we did with the sawtooth waveform. Uh, the reason that it's audible is because of this actually, this, this response wiggle. It's not necessarily the snap itself. And we can see that it rings for a long time. And just about here, it's finally almost done ringing when it gets snapped again. So I can also switch to uh, this kind of a waveform that has a much more gentle slo slope. So I can't hear it anymore because there's less ringing going on. And it's pretty much down to almost no movement. Remember that one uh, interference peak is uh, 650 nanometers. So the chance that this setup I've got with the alligator clip holding a laser diode and everything, I, I, it's reasonable to assume that just air currents are causing it to shift by 650 nanometer. This setup can also measure constant velocity, not just oscillating things like speaker cones. And so in this setup, I've got a motor here with the shaft wrapped in retroreflective tape. And what I'm gonna do is use the laser beam to just graze the side of the motor shaft so that as it's spinning, that piece of retroreflective tape will sort of constantly be moving toward the laser diode or away from it when we switch directions. And um, this should give us a constant signal. So let's check the oscilloscope again. And I'm going to use um, a variable power supply so that I can change the speed of the motor very finely. So let's check out the scope again. Okay, so now the signal looks pretty hectic because the speed is relatively high. Before we had that speaker cone that was moving just, you know, six microns in the span at 60 hertz or something, which is a pretty low linear velocity. But now at the edge of that motor shaft, things are much faster. So the frequency that we would expect to see here is much higher. So we could zoom in and look at this kind of wave by wave, but there's an easier way to do it. We'll use an FFT on the scope uh, to take a look at where the, where the most energy is for this signal. And it's clipping here because we've got so much signal, we actually have to turn things down. So I will turn this down a little bit. Okay, um, maybe a little bit more. Okay. So now the FFT is showing us where there's the most frequency. And don't worry about the roll-off. This is actually uh, mostly due to the amplifier that I'm using and just noise in general. Um, so if I move this, the motor out of the path of the laser beam, 
we saw that peak just went away in here and try to ignore all these little other noise peaks. They, they aren't part of the experiment. So if I put the motor back into place, uh, we can see that this peak here corresponds to the speed of the motor shaft. And I'll prove it to you by changing the speed of the motor. You can actually read off the voltage here that we're feeding the motor. And so if I slowly turn this down, we can see that the peak here starts sliding down the spectrum 10 kilohertz now, and we can almost actually see the 10 kilohertz here. Let's see if I can go any slower. So we're down to 500 millivolts at the motor, and there is kind of a peak here, and you can actually see the um, signal, the raw signal waves here. Let's speed up again. So you can see the voltage is coming up. The peak is here. I'm going to keep going up in voltage. Three and a half volts. Now the peak is up here, 100 kilohertz. If we keep going, you can still see it. Even though we're, we're falling off into here, you can, that's definitely still there. So now I'm going to uh, move the motor out of the way, and you can see that the peak is gone. And if we put it back in here, there it is again. So it's actually a very effective tachometer. You can aim this at anything that's moving and not only determine its vibration to within 600 nanometer accuracy, you can also determine its speed very easily just by looking at the spectrum of, of a signal coming back there. Pretty cool. Okay, so I think this is pretty cool, but there's actually another trick that we can play. Wouldn't it be nice if we could use this system to measure the distance from here to here? Seems almost impossible because this interferometry approach requires some sort of movement to actually get a signal, right? Like no matter where you are in the waveform, if this thing isn't moving, there's no signal we get. So there's no way you can measure an absolute distance with it. But there is a way. Can you think of it? What if I told you that changing the current into the photodiode actually shifts the color of the light very slightly? It's true. And if we modulate the current going into the photodiode, it will actually produce light that is very slightly red or very slightly blue, depending if we're injecting more or less current. So what we can do is feed the laser diode a ramped current waveform. So we're constantly increasing the current for a period of time and then resetting and, and changing the current again. And what will happen is if we emit, let's say, a red photon and it comes out here and bounces off the object, by the time the photon is reflected and comes back in, we're now feeding the laser diode a different current and hence it's operating at a different frequency. So when the photon of a different color comes in, it will interfere with the laser diode, which is now operating at a different frequency, and we'll get a signal out of that, right? Because the whole reason that this interferometry works is because the wavelengths aren't lined up. So if the photon is old, basically it went out and came back, the longer it's spent outside the laser diode, if our ramp keeps changing the, the color of the light very slightly, that means we'll have a bigger shift. And so when all this shakes out, if we give the laser diode a constant current ramp, the further away objects are, the more shifted they will be and we'll get more interferometric signal. Pretty cool. Now this is not an easy thing to get going, so I'm going to set up the um, test setup here. We're going to use the we're going to use channel 2 on the function generator to send a 520 hertz sine wave into the photodiode. And it's going to be set up kind of like this. So we've got most of the current coming from the source measurement unit into the laser diode. And then I've got a capacitor here coupling in the um, function generator. And it's like a 500 hertz signal at 30 millivolts. So this little bit of current ripple will go in and modulate the laser diode. And then we'll use the same setup to look at it on the scope. For the physical setup, what I'll do is put the card with the retroreflector on the table here, and we'll look at it on the scope and see what kind of signal it's producing. And then to shift into a closer object, I'm going to slide this um, block in that also has a retroreflective sticker. So we can kind of slide this in and out to get a distance of about, you know, two centimeter distance change. So we'll see what that looks like. Okay, this setup is a little bit finicky, but I think it proves the point, um, shows that this is possible. The turquoise trace shows the current injection from the signal generator. So we're running at about 520 hertz, and at the photodiode, we're getting like a plus minus 5 millivolt boost here. And since the main amount of power is coming from the source measurement unit, 
um, and this is trying to supply a constant voltage and this is superimposed on top, we can actually check the, um, the current coming out of the measurement unit and see that that's actually sinusoidal, which makes sense because we're altering it here and this thing is just trying to um, supply a constant voltage. So it notices the current keeps changing, which is correct. And then the, turk or the pink trace is coming from the monitor photodiode. And it's not surprising that that also has a sinusoidal shape, right? Because we're making the photodiode, or we're making the laser diode brighter and dimmer at this rate. So, you know, necessarily we're going to see that change. But there's actually another signal superimposed on top here. Notice that the waveform is nice and jagged like this. And it's true that the signal is sometimes hard to catch. It's a little bit hard to pick out, but you can see that it looks stair-steppy. So instead of being nice and smooth, it has this really chunky pattern to it. And those chunks are actually the interference waves that I was talking about that only occur on the slope. So if we turn off the current modulation, all that stair-steppiness goes away. There's still a little bit going on here from just vibrations in the table. But when we turn on this uh, additional waveform, we see this very regular pattern of stair-stepping. And so what I'll do is um, make a copy of it. We'll count the stair steps. There's about four steps on each one of these up and down uh, parts of the wave. And um, this shows a little bit of a cleaner waveform that I captured just a minute ago, but it's, it's about four stair steps. So we'll get that running. And now I'm going to slide in a much closer pattern. So we moved up about half the distance toward the photodiode. And look what happened. Now there's only one stair step between here and here. Um, for this given slew rate, and the, the way that the whole thing is set up and how much the frequency changes, which is a, uh, depending on current, which is a characteristic of the laser diode, now we're only getting one wave of interference as opposed to four waves of interference for this whole setup. So the, the technique is sound. Um, it requires quite a bit of calibration and setup to use it. And the other downside is that if this thing is running and I tap on the table, the table noise, I mean, just, just tapping the table like this produces a whole lot more signal than this um, very sensitive single stair step kind of a deal. So the technique requires a fair bit of um, <laughs> signal massaging and sort of compensation to be useful, which is why typically this is not used, in fact, in industry very much. But it is a pretty cool technique nonetheless, being able to extract you know, sub-micron vibration information, distance information, and uh, speed information all from one laser diode without really any external components. Pretty cool. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that, and I will see you next time. Bye.